Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 21st episode of the Irrelevant Podcast. The Irrelevant Podcast can now legally drink. How? Yes, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention that Jason is here, as usual. <laughs> and we have a nice little album to talk about today. I apologize for the audio quality. My mic shit out on me. I don't have connections for my nicer ones, so it's going to be a short and sweet one this round, I think. Yeah, we guys don't want you to suffer that much with Jason's. Um, I mean, I don't even know how bad it sounds, but like, I'm just, I'm just, you know, using hyperbole just because if it is really that bad, I do want to apologize. <laughs> you know, so just in case, if it's really that awful, I, I'm really sorry. But you're not here about the sound quality and our tech and our specs and all that stuff. You're here about our opinions that don't matter. About music that, in the long run, doesn't matter, but we're going to talk about it anyways. So, Blood Mountain. Do you have any background on this album? Because I know you... Sorry. So... You so gave I me mean, some background on Crack of the Sky, which was the last Mastodon album we did, for those who don't know. Yeah. Um, and Jason told me a little bit about, like what this this actual overall themes were and stuff like that but yeah if you have anything about like those kind of things yeah if you could tell me about those so all their stuff is <coughs> excuse me concept albums and this one i don't know it i don't quite remember it it has like a monster kind of theme so it's like the names like the wolf is loose crystal skulls sleeping giant capillarian crest colony of birchman hunters of the sky so like it's they always have like really weird names, but they have also really cool album covers too. Uh, but I, I don't remember yeah. what the concept for this one was. I like I think their was, names. Yeah. yeah, I think the it was a guy the songs that. Are good. Yeah, the names of songs are cool. I I think it's just about a guy that goes to the top of the Blood Mountain to find a crystal skull and all the monsters and shit he has to face to get up there. I think that's what it is. But, um, but yeah, no, this one was before Crack the Sky, so this one was a little bit heavier. Um, not as proggy as the as Crack the Sky, so I'm curious to know what you thought about this one. Um, well, there was a lot of prog in it, in the sense that like it had a bunch of weird like time signatures. Yeah. Like in um the fourth track, Capillarian Crest. That one's fucking hard to play. Yeah, I bet. I was gonna ask you about that. That those riffs and like the actual I can imagine the drumming is just a nightmare. And it, yeah. it's constantly switching and all this stuff. And that's what, like, I think just the biggest thing about that Mastodon has going for them is that they're just a really impressive band in terms of, like, their actual ability to play instruments. You know? Yeah, I totally agree. Like, it's, yeah, like, all the stuff they pull off, I'm like, wow, that that's, uh, that's cool, man. I mean, I I am drawn more towards their more melodic stuff. Yeah, um, and like, don't get me wrong. A lot of the stuff, like this, this is a this is a really great album. Um, I'm gonna say right off the bat, it's rock friggin' solid. Um, so, for reference, Crack the Sky, the last album that Jason recommended by Mastodon. Initially, when I listened to it, I did really like it. I was like, yeah, this is really good. But then over time, it just it kept getting better. And I, it's it's at least a nine, probably a ten. Like I think Crack the Sky is insanely good specifically the song on it the czar i think that's like that song is a masterpiece yeah it's like i said that was their opus it's hard to top but i think after for blood mountain this is the album they're kind of because i think this is the one that was directly before crack the sky if i'm not mistaken i might be wrong but i think it was somewhere close to it and it like I mean, not only is their stuff hard to play, but it's very creatively written, too. So it's a bunch of weird passages and chord picking that you'd never expect to do, <laughs> that you have to do if you want to learn a Mastodon song. So Very unorthodox. Yeah, but they have a lot of really weird songs on this album, and a lot of weird sounds just in general. I love the effects that they use on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I was going to bring up. I absolutely adored, especially like on tracks like The Wolf is Loose, and Sleeping Giant. I love yeah. just like that cascady kind of like like crying guitar high pitched 
like high note sound. I don't even know what it was. It was so good. And I loved like like how the melody, like I was explaining, like it was Cassian. Like it just felt like it was like just trickling down in like it it, it it it's really hard to explain without just like listening to it and know what I'm talking about. But if like you do listen to the music, you do know what I'm talking about. And it's it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about, but like I said, they have so many effects and so many layers of different types of sound. I, it's hard to know which ones you're specifically talking about. But, um, you know, the, the intro, it's starting off with The Wolf is Loose. Like, I think, because, like, they have some elements of, like, punk-sounding rhythms and, like, just, like, fast-paced drumming and that has a punk sort of feel. Um, but, yes, I didn't, I didn't really think of that, but, yeah, okay. Yeah, but, like, the vocals are pretty aggressive, and not just, like, oh, they're screaming, like, they just, it's, like, weird screaming, like, it just sounds really aggressive without, for lack of a better word. Yeah, there was this song, I don't remember which one it was, like, I couldn't tell if it was humans singing or, or if it was, like, instruments. It was, like, a bunch of, like, like demon noises. I don't yeah, remember it was, what track it was on. This is probably Brent Hines. <laughs> okay. Fucking okay. had a throat infection, sounds like a pterodactyl on one of the live videos. Um, but, <laughs> do you remember which track it was? Uh, I'm, I'm blanking. It's been a minute. Um, was it Crystal Skull? Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so that was a guest vocalist. It's, uh, oh, what the fuck is that guy's name? He's the lead vocalist for um, Neurosis, which is a band that Mastodon, they're like an older sludgy kind of band, so like Mastodon's earlier albums kind of was reminiscent of that sound. And oh, okay. so he was a guest vocalist on Crystal Skull, but I love the, the like the like the really tribal sounding drums in the beginning. Mm, yeah, that's something I really liked about it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think Sleeping Giants was that was probably my favorite song. I really did like. I loved the Wolf Is Loose. Yeah. That was such a good opening track. Yeah. Honestly, like the first like nine songs are pretty comparable and like you know in in, in quality Af after that i don't really rec i don't really remember what the other ones those are the really were. weird songs like i said they they get a lot more psychedelic okay. as the albums run yeah so this mortal soil siberian divide and pendulous skin were very weird songs okay. from them <laughs> we'll, we'll, well get to those um yeah this mortal soul i kind of remember but i just remember yeah those ones were they were less melodic and so, like, they didn't resonate with me as much. And obviously, like I've explained in our past recommendations, how melodic music just tends to it just it just resonates with me more, and I'm able to actually, you know, remember it when we're talking about it on the podcast. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, Hunters of the Sky. I remember that when that came on, I was did that like awoke something like in, in my soul it was, it was really hard to describe yeah that one's a brutal song <laughs> yeah but like that beginning when like it just keeps going with the drums and stuff i'm just like oh man yeah and that yeah, riff, that one that that goes hard yeah yeah that one was hard and like i said kepler and crest that one's another really weird one like i said the one of the guitarists the guy that does the weird animal noises for singing he's the one that does all the leads and the solos and things and that really like he, he does like that redneck finger pick banjo thing that's super fucking hard to play especially like those really fast licks on the kind of like the the inner the in instrumental section in the middle of the song before it gets like heavy yeah 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 that um, one's really fun um circle of side squatch this one is a so i think i kind of chalk it down to the recording because the live versions of the song are fucking brutal but for some reason, like, it's it's in such a low tuning that, like, it's just the mix is kind of muddied, so it doesn't sound like it's that cool of a song. Um, mm -hmm. But if you listen to the live version, like, the, the riff in there is fucking really sick. But I like that song a lot, especially, like, in the last part, which just breaks down and gets just super heavy and slow. Yeah, I've yet to do that with um, any of their music, is listen to them live. I've never done that. They're a great live band. They're the only way. The only way where they're kind of hit and miss is with the vocals. Okay. Um, yeah, because like I can imagine, are they past their prime? In terms I mean, of that, they're older. Or like it's yeah. Just, right. Yeah. Like it's not the same going to see them now as opposed to like back in you know two thousand six. 
Well, they've always kind of been hit or miss, but like, again, they're playing such difficult music. So like singing and playing that at the same time is not going to be perfect every night. <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 I know. Um, but it's also just, like when you play something in a studio, it's very different than playing it in, you know, a concert. But yeah, um, yeah and, and going back to like the the actual themes and like the the cover art and everything, and there's something I really liked about Crack the Sky is just like there's this some, there's something about their music. And keep in mind, guys, like I've only listened to two of their albums at this point, and there are and I already love them, but. So similar to Crack the Sky, like it just it's just had this element of like story and it's not like in your face like, oh, this is like a story album. It's just kind of and like, like you don't even need to know that really and you could still enjoy it. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah I, I, I loved. Point. Yeah, I loved how you explained to me how it's just like this, you know, like that this guy needs to go up the blood mountain to get whatever he needs and needs to fight all these demons on the way. Like that sounds great. I'd love to see like an animated like short about this, like with yeah. the music, that would be awesome. Their How do videos they do that? Really funny. Do like, they do really that? Kind of or yeah, like... they have specific videos and some of the songs that follow the themes. A lot of it is nonsensical and a lot of it's kind of silly, but they do like a lot of cool visual stuff. Um, but, uh, okay. Bron Daler, the drummer, he's the one that com he writes all the lyrics and comes up with most of the concepts for the albums. Okay. Um, I see. but yeah, yeah, him like the, for the drumming that he does and singing at the same time is fucking wild. <laughs> oh, he drums and sings at the same time. Yeah. There's three vocalists in that band. There used to be four. They all used to scream and sing, but so yeah, the oh, bass okay. player, one of the guitar players and the drummer is the vo So they have three vocalists in this band. They all have different parts. The guy that kind of like yells, is the bass player the guy that does like the like the weird kind of redneck yelling is the guitar player and then the the clean singing like the guy that sings in oblivion that's the drummer ah okay that is yeah <laughs> that, that makes a lot more sense yeah you, you thought it was one guy <laughs> i didn't i didn't know i wasn't really paying attention to that yeah it, it's three guys singing okay that sounds more redneck <laughs> they all have like distinctively different voices I'm, I'm surprised you didn't catch that no i just wasn't sure how well i, I don't know i just didn't really think about that <laughs> um but um yeah so that one's yeah obviously cool. i do agree with you that this one was it was heavier and like it so that it could, in that sense it didn't resonate with me as much but the thing about their music as, and even like the stuff that's heavier on Crack the Sky, um, they still have this thing like they, they like demand your attention. I think and like they really they hit hard yeah. and like I'm not and I'm not saying that in the cliche way like oh like this like X metal band like like they hit it hard like this band like actually like they they do hit it hard and I'm not <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, um, like they. Their music, you can zone out to it. You can listen to every detail. You can listen to like the general kind of thing. Like they're they're really well crafted pieces. Like each every each and every one of their songs. And like not n none of the songs feel like they're just filler or that you know th like we we need to make this longer or something like that. Like all the songs do feel like they need to be there, even if they are kind of similar sounding if you see what i'm saying like there's just something yeah. about the way like also something you brought up how their songs like 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 when i was asking about oh what was this specific part you're like i don't know they have like a billion different parts in all the songs and i'm like oh yeah that's true because like all of their songs like they're all like yeah, one song could have like five different riffs and port like Yeah. <laughs> ex exactly. They're all like symphonies. They have like all these different movements and all these different like parts and stuff. It's it's really really well done. They're like I mini think, symphonies. <laughs> yeah, and this is one thing that some like this is one of the like there's a couple reasons why people can't get into Mastodon and one of them is the production. Like it is pretty muddied and like it's very like they call it sludge metal for a reason. So like it's not as clear. So especially with the vocals, when you first hear them, it can kind of be overwhelming. Um, yeah. The other reason too is yeah. like 
most traditional, I mean, most prog is wanky, so it's like they're going to fit a bunch of different types of riffs and melodies into one song and different time changes and whatever have you. I always felt like Mastodons were cohesive. Like, it, they could have a totally different riff in a totally different key, and it could still match to me as being part of the same song. Not that many other prog bands I feel that way for, but I, for some reason Mastodon, it just works with me. Their transitions is what I like, but some people think it's too abrasive. Um, but I like them a lot. Blade Catcher is one of those to me. I think is kind of a filler track. I don't really, I don't really fuck with it too much. Colony of Birchman, though, I remember. love that song. <laughs> oh yeah, like I, uh, like, like you said, Blade Catcher. I don't even like remember what it was off the top of my head. But yeah, Colony yeah. of Birchman, that that's awesome. What what are Birchmen? I don't know. I, I assume it's like tree monsters or something. No, oh, oh, like like birch. Birch is a okay. tree. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see. Yeah. No. That was a. That was a good one. I love that riff. Is so fucking fun to play. I play that riff all the time. Mm, yeah. Um. So that one's great. Hand of Stone. Um. Is one of those ones where like I love like they do a lot of catchy melodies and that's one of my favorite catchy melodies that they've ever done on that one. I'm trying to remember. Wait. Let me listen to a sample of this for a second because I'm trying. I I, I kind of got some of them confused. It's like a minute in or something. It's like the main melody of the guitar. It does like the um, descending scale or ascending scale, kind of like the Wolf Is Loose did, but it was a little bit different. Oh yeah, I see that. Yeah, that sounds quite hard to play. <laughs> yeah. So, but then again, then they have the the fucking speed riff. So like they throw all that shit in between them, and that's that's the one thing I like about Mastodon. I've always liked their speed picking riffs because they always just sound so fucking cool. Yeah, no, and, and also, like, I'm pulling up the lyrics on this. Like, this, I really did, like, a lot of the of, of the lyrics of this. Like, um, like, on Hand of Stone, Venom yeah. stains the lips and burns the tongue with vengeance and hatred. Extremities forged in nature's fire. Unrelenting vigor, carve the future. Feast or famine, drink at deception. The wells run dry, the need for temptation. Like, that is awesome. Yeah, like I got, oh man, they might have like some of my favorite favorite lyrics. Honestly, yeah, their lyrics are really fun. I remember um, this is on their other album called The Hunter. It's a song called Curl the Burl, and I wanted to cover it with my band because I thought it was a super catchy song. But the vocalist kept laughing at the lyrics because the <laughs> the first two lines of the song were "I killed a man because he killed my goat." <laughs> <laughs> Like I, they just like I said, they, their sense of humor is really funny. It's like they have a goofy sense of humor, and that kind of transpires into their videos, into some of the lyrics of their songs, and just also like their overall theme in general. Um, but they, yeah, they they have a lot of different music throughout their catalog. Like I said, they start super fucking heavy, and then they just progressively get more proggy and mellow and just psychedelic as the as the albums go by. Because there's a ton, there's like. God, you're only two albums in, man. There's fucking like eight albums total, I think. Yeah, I'm excited to listen to more. Like this one, um, it's 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 really hard to explain what like the scenery and emotions and stuff that that are conjured up when listening to these kinds of things. But yeah. um, on a lot of them, like. I just really, I, I really did get that like hunter vibe. Like I'm just in the middle of like the woods. You yeah, know? they always and have I, a. I, I feel like this out because like they always have that elemental feel to it. People always assume so. It's like fire was remission. That was like their first album. It was like a horse that was on fire and just super. Just it just it felt very torturous. It was a very burning kind of feeling. And then on Leviathan, which is their Moby Dick themed album, is very just it you felt like you want to fucking take over a ship and then this one's earthy you get like a fucking crushing kind of feeling and then crack the sky it's just very fluid and psychedelic and airy it just it it always makes me think of different like elements and scenery it just it feels like i'm connected to something mm. bigger it's just like i'm i'm more like in a primal state when i listen to them yeah and like the way i was talking about with the 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 like hunting in the woods like it didn't feel like in like a creepy like horror movie kind of sense it just felt like a like i'm like facing i don't know 
like the trials or something or like i'm just i'm just going out to hunt and like just get food for like my my kids or something i don't know yeah i, I hope that makes sense but no, um, yeah i feel you it, like i said just it it releases some in- instinctual thing with me every time i listen to it um yeah and as far well, as the album art goes did you like this one or the crack the sky one better that is that is hard i love the um i'm probably gonna flash it on the screen I love the like the three headed uh mo- is that a moose or I think like it's a, a deer, deer or something. The deer, yeah. Oh yeah, that's a deer. Like I love the three headed deer and how it's blue and how that that's contrasted in the back by like just the the yellow orange sun. That looks so nice. Yeah. I love all the the monsters and all the th- creatures and shit on their album covers. Um and once more around the sun is one of my favorite cover. It's not one of my favorite albums from them, but for album covers, it's one of my favorite album covers ever. Oh, like that weird bug. Like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. It's, it's just some weird space monster thing, but it's so bright and colorful. And I love, um, my favorite type of art to look at is like art with a lot of moving lines and flowing patterns. So I love when people incorporate that into landscapes or creatures or whatever. And it's super color. It's, oh, it's one of my favorite album covers ever. Oh man, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the crack the sky one again. Oh, uh, that's the crack the sky one is like really good though. Yeah. I love like the colors and the spinning wheel in the middle and how it comes out and it's like purple and blue. Yeah, it's yeah. Leviathan's hard. a cool one too. Yeah, that one's cool. Um, I really like. Ooh, I see Emperor of Sand. That looks pretty cool. Yeah, that one's cool. Do you see Once More Around the Sun? Yeah, yeah. That one is pretty freaky. But yeah. it's cool. I don't know. Like, I love the the teeth and how it, like, kind of comes out. Yeah. The eyes it look into, like the, into, the like, red licorice wheels. I know, right? And then it has, like, that on his right side eye, he has, like, all the million eyes coming out and, like, the antenna. Yeah. And then you see all those plant thingies at the bottom. Oh, man. that's And it's yeah. li- li- got some leaf vibe. This is really cool. Yeah, so it's like yeah. I love their album cover names. I love their album covers. I love their song names. I love their themes. Like, I feel like this, like, even if you don't like the song, you definitely can get the feeling of what they're going for. And I love when, like, an artist incorporate every aspect of that. So, like I said, their songs, their albums, their all that shit is just, it just works together to make you have an atmosphere created. It's really nice. Yeah, um, I think the only one that's bad is the hunter. I don't like that one at all. You don't like that deer one? No, it looks it looks totally different than like and just off from the other ones. You know what's funny is uh, a lot of the people that are hardcore fans of them think that's their worst album. Oh, okay. Maybe there's a correlation. <laughs> well, I think it's because like there's not that many heavy songs on this one. Like this is like the transition of when they were going kind of softer. Because I think, if I'm not mistaken, this came after Crack the Sky, so everybody, I think, was disappointed after listening to Crack the Sky and waiting for another album, yeah. and they get The Hunter. Let me make sure that's yeah. right, though. I just, it's been a while since I've... Um, I don't remember what years there are. Didn't also, like, the years that these albums came out in, too. Yeah, 2000... Oh, man. 2002, 4, 8, 6, 8, 11... Oh, man. Yeah, so Crack the Sky was 2009, and then The Hunter was in 2011. So I think people think it's their, <laughs> their worst album because it came right after Crack the Sky. Yeah, who would have knew? <laughs> I, I like that album cover, though. Yeah, I think my, 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 I think my favorite is probably the Once More Around the Sun. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's a good one. But I, don't know, I honestly really don't know which one's my favorite. Like, they're all really cool. Crack Their the newest sky. one's kind of boring, but it's kind of cool though. I like that with the gray and like the trees. Yeah, it's kind it of. It nicely. reminds me of, like a storybook, like an old like old like youth, uh, youth novel yeah. or something. That makes or sense. Fairy tale or fable. Right. Yeah. Well, Leviathan's um, cool because um, not just on the album cover, they have like a poster to where like you get the full. Like, you just see the whale, you know, 
fucking blasting below the ship but there's one where it's like um it's like a big circle then there's like it, it simulates like heaven and like people are sh like shooting down with spears and it's just like underneath it's like a massive picture it's really cool i want to get it as a poster yeah man i am really looking forward to listening to more of them but i think i kind of want to keep my listening to them like exclusive to this podcast you want you want to go through all the albums I wouldn't mind doing that. I mean, the ones you want, like, I, I'll, okay, I'll put it this way. I, I'll do the ones you want me to listen to on the podcast. So, like, all the ones that you don't really care about talking about, we don't have to do that. I think the only one that I don't want to have you listen to is their first album. I don't think you're going to get anything from it. I like it because the it took me the longest time to like it. But the riffs are just so fucking brutal on that album. But it's just nothing but, like, hardcore, like aggressive screaming but not even like the in the traditional sense it's just it's like incomprehensible it just sounds like aggressive like grunting and just it's really primal sounding it's it's cool but like i don't think you're gonna get anything from that album so i think that's the only one that i'm not gonna have you listen to on here you can listen to it on your own yeah i'll do that and we can because just talk a lot about of it. a lot yeah, of hardcore like <laughs> metal fans think that that's their best album they think like remission is the best album and then crack the sky is the second best album no, oh, is is it's like the deal with Metallica, where like hardcore metal people are like, "Kill 'em all" is the best, and then yeah, it's shit. Ride, like that. ride the lightning is the second best. To, to me, "Crack the Sky" is ten times more fucking dynamic than their first album, but I don't know. But oh, I was gonna show you. To look it. at like so. This is one of my favorite iterations. I'm sending it to you on Snap. This is the. I don't remember if this was the back cover. Or this is like the extended poster of it. But this is Whoa, the full one for Leviathan. That, that is nice how is that why is that not like the full cover i don't know i it, it always been so good <laughs> yeah it's one of my favorites and i think it's one artist that does all their album art if i'm not mistaken either one or two of them yeah who is this guy i don't know his name but i think he does a lot of their like i say he does the majority of their album covers wait is it the same guy who did the cover for letter alice no it's not alex gray Oh, it's great. Okay, so it's not him. Right. Um, yeah, going back to crack the sky, and like comparing it with um, with uh, don't remember, Blood Mountain. Sorry, I don't even remember that. Just for a second, just just in my mind. But when I'm comparing them, so like when I was talking about the feelings and stuff that it conjures up, so like Blood Mountain brings up like hunting primal kind of stuff. And then Crack the Sky, I think, is more, like, more feels like a, like, kind of, like, samurai wisdom kind of stuff. And, like, um, and, like, it, it has this Odyssey vibe to it, especially on, like, tracks like The Czar. I mean, that song in itself, like, you just, you go on an adventure. Yeah. It and sounds it, very cerebral, I think. But not in, like, a, in, not, like, in an intelligent way. It's just you use a lot more of the mind as opposed to, like, instinct. I see. Like, yeah, you I see. What you're like saying. a hunting instinct. Yeah. Well, in that case, I would say that like, um, crack the sky is more like. It's not intellectual. It's just it's it's more like you. It's more like. I don't know meditation. Yeah, it's more and zen. Then, yeah, it's more zen. That's a good way to put it. And then. Which is really mm -hmm. interesting, and Tool kind of has that same dynamic of, like, aggressive music being calming you down and relaxing you to the point of being able to meditate, if you can, or just making you feel zoned out, or just... Like I said, my favorite thing to do by listening to this type of music is, like, driving by the mountains, or, like, sitting on a beach, or, like, something with really pretty scenery is one of my favorite things to do, or one of my favorite kind of mixtures to listen with, with this kind of music. Yeah, man, I listen to the czar and also like oblivion and divination i listened to like the whole crack sky album like in the loudon county mountain hilly area that was perfect oh, and yeah. also yeah that felt really good and like i know i keep talking about like the czar that that song is like was so good for that like that sunrise and stuff like that Ooh, like um and also well with crack the sky i think there was a lot more levity whereas opposed to blood mountains more like um like, it's more hustle and bustle, and it doesn't... 
I'm not saying it doesn't allow you just to like stop for a second, but there's less of that, and it's more of just like the just the drum beats and stuff like that. Yeah, it's like I said, it's a more aggressive album. Like the riffs hit you harder, shit's faster. It's been that's why like they what I feel like the last three songs, the last three songs are kind of like that fade out kind of thing. So it's like the whole album kicked you in the fucking face, and then they just kind of slowly let you ride out the rest of it and relax. You know what I mean? Yeah, cause yeah, exactly, cause that's like what makes me want to go back and listen to it more, um, because I remember th- there was a point where like I I stopped actually like paying attention to the music when I was when I was in my 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 car, like doing the stuff from like my job, and I didn't realize that that's why <laughs> it's because the music was I guess less engaging. Yeah, and it was just like a zone out. But I yeah, that makes me I need to go back and listen to it. I think um, that's the difference because like Mastodon has very like they have a very identifiable rel- like riffs and melodies and the last three songs just kind of vibe out. Yeah. Except for like on on I love the I don't I'm trying to figure out what effects that they use on this mortal soil. The it's like a very slow phaser, like a very wispy kind of sound. And it's just super warm. It's you know that that intro riff on that song. On uh, which song you said? This mortal soil. Yes, 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 yes. I love the sound for that. Um, so do I, yeah. The other one that's really cool and is uh, Pendulous Skin. That one starts off with a very, like... It, they, do, they, 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 pick, they do a lot of weird, like, chord picking and, like, very dissonant chords, and that's kind of their charm, even, like, on the heavier stuff, but on the slower stuff, too. But, like... That one gives me like a beachy vibe. It's just super psychedelic. It's like a, like an Eagles uh-huh. or Pink Floyd kind of deal. I don't really remember that track. I need to go back and listen. It's to the it. last one. Like it, it starts off right. yeah. with the like with the dissonant chord, and then it just speeds up and slows down again to like a very pulsy, vibey Pink Floyd kind of thing. Right. Um, then, well, actually, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. What were you gonna say? I was just gonna say, uh, Siberian Divide. That's a very weird one. Like that one. I, I I did like that one. That one was cool. Yeah, the the way they do that. Like I said, very just dissonant kind of. That one's kind of creepy, which is really cool. Yeah, I didn't think you're gonna like that one. I, I I did. Um, but actually, what I was gonna talk about, how you brought up with this this mortal soil, that reminded me, um, because I I re- I remember that there was a song later on in the album that like i remember i was like oh that one was really cool and then i just i listened to a little excerpt from this mortal soil i'm like oh yeah it was that one that that riff is really 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 like just like adrenaline inducing yeah and that's one of those ones that has to come it comes down to effects so it's like it's like a really like they always mess with cool sounds i I love the way that one sounds I, it's it, you can't really describe it until you fucking like hear it because like I said it's millions of different types of pedals some studio EQing like it's just a very specific way that it's being played so like the riff on its own is fine but like that's where the effect really carries it. Yeah. Um, do you know what? Like another thing that this that um, Blood Mountain and also um, Crack the Sky like what what they conjure up in my mind. What? Have you ever seen Scooby Doo? <laughs> um, which one is it? The, oh, uh, it's, it's called it's called Chill Out Scooby Doo. Uh, it it's doesn't like, sound familiar. It's like the one where they go to Nepal and like they're in the Himalayas. It's, oh, it's the real... Yeti. Yes, yeah. yes, and and you know what I'm talking about? It's the best part of the movie. It's like when it's so trippy. Like it's like when like Shaggy and Scooby go to they go to Shangri La. It's so bizarre. And like it's it's like cuz there's that guy who's played by I think James Hong is his name. He plays a he's kind of typecast as like the Asian dude in a lot of movies. Um, he also voices Poe's dad in Kung Fu Panda, but there's like that. Yeah, right. There's like that that dude, and then he's like kind of floats, but like not really. And he has that entrance with the gong. He's a really like m- like mysterious character, and he brings them to Shangri La, and it, it's just I'm like it's so bizarre. And like I'm remembering this now. This was in like Scooby Doo, and like that's that's like what this um. These kind of things make me think of because, like, when when I was just thinking back to the movie, there was just like those 
they would go into like caves and like ruins and stuff like that and like walls with like paintings on them and then also like they would just they would go into these l- large hallways and like there was these underground caverns where like these railroads were and they would also go outside and like i don't know if it was because like i'm pretty sure it was shangri-la and like i didn't know if it was real or not it was really 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 trippy and yeah. like they would just see these these beautiful like you know outdoor landscapes with like waterfalls and like the sunshine and like the 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 forests and stuff like that and like yeah it's really hard to explain why this music makes me think of that well, I but think it's because, it's, like, with Scooby-Doo, right, the reason why it was cool, because, like, you got, like, they went to, like, they basically explored the world and, like, ran into a bunch of different types of mythological creatures and monsters, and that kind of thing, and that's kind of oh, the same yeah, sort of feeling yeah. with the Mastodon album, so it's, like, it gives you a worldly feeling, but not specifically, especially because, like, with the different sounds that they use and the different emotions that you feel and just the different imagery and stuff like that. Um, that's what I'm saying. I like when artists give you an experience like that, where it's like you can listen to a piece of music and it like represents a totally different aspect of um, other cultures. It's really fun. Yeah, because like it, this feels kind of um, like it, it feels worldly, but it also feels like stoner early two thousands American and stuff like that. It's it's a yeah. really cool blend, and like it doesn't really feel like it's opposing each other. Like it blends really well, and I think Scooby Doo is like a similar thing, you know. Where yeah. it has like those those stoner early two thousands things, yeah. but then it also you know like they travel the world like I said like I know there's the one where they go to Hawaii there's the one where they go to Mexico and all that stuff and they... in Australia too I think yeah I think have you seen the Mexican one yeah the chupacabra yeah that one yeah. I think is my that's my favorite one that one's good yeah I watched all of that when I was younger and like and that's kind of what made me be interested in about learning about different types of cultures. Um, and like basically what got me into ancient archaeology and all that kind of shit and listen to this kind of music um the one frustrating thing that really like it doesn't bother me much anymore because i've kind of grown out of that like irritation but i remember when i was in high school because i've been listening to mastodon since i was in high school um and i remember like he's like you know like the stigma that this kind of music has so it's like oh it's either just like fast nonsense or it's just satanic or whatever like it's not like taken as a serious thing it's like, I mean, for this genre, this is more of a niche genre of metal. Um, but right, like, and that's why I really like it because it just, it's really tailored well to what I like about metal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, I remember it frustrating me so much, especially like when I'm listening to certain songs and like <laughs> my parents just be like, just not understanding like what it is and just thinking that like I'm listening to Slayer, which is like really sloppy, fast, shitty riffs and like talking about like satanic stuff or it's like anti-christian or whatever the fuck and like these guys are just talking about like weird monsters and journey you know what i mean like it's it was totally misrepresented (laughs) yeah because it's like there's the the idea of like what what people think metal is like that don't listen to it as opposed to like what some of it is and then what actually a large portion of it kind of is Yeah, because now I can give a fuck either way, but I just remember that, like, especially with, because, like, it made me feel like something different back then, and, like, wow, like, I never heard any other band that does anything like this, and then, you know, like, people listen to it, and it's just, like, (laughs) they just don't understand what it is, and it's just, like, how it sounds so different to everything else. Like, on this, on, like, on, like, like, Sleeping Giant and stuff like that, like, there's this, there's this aroma of intimacy in the, in the music, you know? And I, I get that a lot from Mastodon and, like, also Tool and stuff like that. It's just, like, yeah, this weird, like, only I understand this kind of thing. Like, other people just won't know. And, like, only... <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I feel that, especially, like, with the with Sleeping Giant, especially playing it to, like, the, the delayed lead intro that it gets into on that one. Yeah, I love that effect. It just feels like yeah. it's just, like, someone in tears... Yeah, that one, like, and then the intro yeah. to Ghost of Corellia that's on the Crack the Sky one, that delayed lead Ooh, intro. Yeah. I love that one, too. Yeah, I, I just one. I love when people fuck around with delay pedals like that. Yeah, you can get some cool shit with that. Um, I see that there's a deluxe edition with the... It has some live versions on that. Do you, have you listened to that? On Blood Mountain or Crack the Sky? Uh, Blood Mountain. I think I have. What were the songs? They did a live version from for, for Capillarian Crest. Yeah. Blood and Blood and Thunder. 
I don't know. That's not a song from this album. Yeah, Blood and Thunder is off of Leviathan. That's actually their most famous song. That's off of Leviathan? Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Um, like, I was talking about this, like, weird, into, like, aroma of intimacy and, like, um, only I can understand this. Like, I get that on on the Czar as well. Yeah, because, Especially, like, I mean... Like, I, we're talking about having the patience to listen to a long song, but that one, like, it, it doesn't, like, if you can, like, if, like, when you listen to it, like, it, like, what is, like, does it remind you of any other bands? Um, no, nah, I mean, I mean, maybe some Tool, but even that, like, not really. That's what I'm saying, like, I feel like they just have their own unique style, and it just... Yeah, exactly, because, I mean, the actual, like, the most metal parts about that song in the first half, they just, I mean, yeah. like, they, I can't really think of, like, they, they're not really derivative of other bands, and also, like, um, the, um, like, the stuff in the end when, like, or in the second half when it's a lot, like, more, it's, like, more serious, and, like, well, I mean, the first half is serious, too, but, like, it's where, where like, the, it's, it's more solemn, and, like, more contemplative in the, in the second half. That one, because, like, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you could say, like, it sounds like it, it, it's, it's reminiscent of Tool, but, like, not really. I mean, it's only reminiscent of Tool in the sense of, like, what it's going for. Yeah, like, the, but the actual of it. Right, but, like, the actual way in, wh- in which it's done and, like, the note selection yeah. and stuff like that. Because that's a big thing, because Tool writes in, like, s- similar keys in a lot of their songs. And yeah. Not like that's a bad thing, but, like, Mastodon, they write in, like, a billion different, like, I don't even... <laughs> well, they also you know? play in three tunings. They play in, like, D standard, drop C, and drop A, so it's, like, that also helps right. when you switch around your tune. Like, Tool primarily plays in drop D, and they have, like, a couple songs maybe in, like, a weird drop B tuning, like Parabola. Right. Um, yeah. But, no, I I mean, it just comes down, like, I, I love Adam Jones. He's one of my favorite guitar players, but I don't think he could play half the shit that <laughs> the guitar players in Mastodon can do. <laughs> <laughs> that's just yeah, a fact. that's a good point. But um, yeah, like they just really do have their own kind of style, and like they still have um, like Sleeping Giant has those unique things you talked about, and they still have like in the in like the actual verses and stuff like that. They have like those dun, dun, where like it, you can kind of like someone can hear that and go like, yeah, that's like kind of like like new metal and, and stuff like that like like post 2000 metal and stuff like that but um that's like i guess the most mainstream thing about them like yeah they're pretty like much their own concoction yeah and like it it, it always comes down to the different ways because like obviously like there are millions of bands in this genre and not even this genre in like jazz and classical as well where like people are very talented with their instruments but it's just they're these like the way that they write is very different than like because like I listen to fucking tech death which is I guess technically in its own right like the hardest genre of metal to play like super fast fucking speed picking sweet picking bunch of hybrid techniques fucking just insane chords and just eight strings and like just like super difficult shit to play but a lot of it sounds like like a lot of the bands kind of sound similar to each other these guys their music is difficult on a whole other level because it's like different types of chords, a lot of bouncing. It's very specific stylized techniques, and it's just the way that they construct and write is super creative as opposed to just doing really hard scales. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think that's the difference between, like, because, like, you, like, you can say that about so many, like, oh, their music's hard to play, so then it's automatically better. It's like, no, just because it's difficult doesn't make it automatically better. It's just the way that it's constructed. Well, ex- exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of like a band that does that. Um, Plays difficult music and it sounds really good. No, and it sounds bad. Oh, and it sounds um, bad. I so guess like, like not Lorna Shore or some shit like that. Their their music is not that difficult to play. Um, oh, okay. Like if you yeah, if you I, like I, if you have like an intermediate slash like if you've been playing metal for a while, you can play a lot of Lorna Shore riffs. A lot of it is just like slow chug, speed pick, slow chug, speed pick. Not so much scales or really hard runs going in their music. It's just like if you have great rhythm and timing, you can play Lorna Shore. Um, I, was just like, thro- I, was, I was just throwing names out. 
don't yeah, know. something like Dream Theater. I think I like some of Dream Theater stuff, but like a lot of it's hard to play, and I just think a lot of it's boring. It's just a lot of like runs and scales and fast sweeps and all that from John Petrucci, and especially their keyboard player too. But like I don't know, and ba- everybody in that band besides the singer, I think is talented. Okay, I've never listened to them. They're just they're very they're like the definition of prog. Um, another band where like their stuff isn't like super super difficult, but it's also very creative is Opeth. You might like some of Opeth's songs. I've never listened to them. I've never even heard of them. They kind of give a similar sort of feel to Mastodon, but they're more folky and like fairy tale esque and more whimsical. Like do you feel like you're like in a story, like a medieval story or something, or like stuff like that. They give more of that kind of feeling. Okay. Interesting. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just I want to keep listening to Blood Mountain. I I, I have the same kind of a, a, a opinion about it from when I first listened to Crack the Sky. I was like, yeah, this is like really good, and I want to listen to it more. Like I, I do want to listen to this more, um, especially like those later tracks, like you were talking about, where I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't realize how, like, um, how that how they were just like. Um, how, how do you say, like, um, not, not fade out, um, I'm blanking. They just kind of like, made them more out. mellow. Yeah, yeah zone, zone out, mellow, kind of solemn stuff. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. And um, yeah. a lot of their stuff, too, it kind of grows on you. Like, there's a lot of songs when I first listened to I didn't like, and then they just grow. I mean, that's the cool thing about their music, because they have so many different types of riffs. You might miss the coolness of some of this and like you listen to the songs again and like every now and again like i'll listen to some of their songs and there's a riff where i really want like in the middle of the night it's like i want to learn how to play this little part in that one mastodon song so it's like those riffs inspire me to just pick it up and try to learn them so that's the one thing about me that i think is really cool with their music is just every now and again like you'll think of a specific riff in a song randomly and just really like that part and listen to that song for a while and like that goes and switches to different songs yeah, that happened to me with Crack the Sky, where I was like, oh, wait, there was that one particular part. And I'm like, wait, what part? Of, what song was that part of? And stuff. I'm like, yeah, that, that's really good, and stuff like that. Do you yeah. want to try to learn to play any of them? No, I'm not saying that, but I'm just like, oh, that was really good. <laughs> no, 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 I know, I know what you're saying. I'm saying, like, do you, like, want to, do you have the ambition to learn any of them? Maybe some of them, like, the more melodic stuff, like, just the, the, the simple main parts of, like, the melody. But no, I'm much more interested in learning. Like tool riffs. Yeah, this one's a little bit easier. Yeah, or like a tool, like some. There's some mega stuff I would really like to play. You definitely could play the intro to Sleeping Giant, though. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I actually I could see myself doing that. I All wanted you need to. That is, nah, is true. I kind of wanted to play um, some stuff in the Czar and Oblivion. Oblivion's a hard song to play. Yeah. Like talking about which part the chorus part or the intro riff? Cause I've been way too long. That part. <laughs> so the chorus part. Yeah, I thought yeah. that part was not as bad. Yeah, that part's not super difficult. It has some weird chords in there, but uh, overall not bad. Um, the czar is uh, that's a hard song. <laughs> Well, I'm talking about like the more mellow, solemn stuff in the second half. Like I'm sure that that first half is is probably brutal. <laughs> yeah. I love the my favorite riff of all time is like when in the middle of the song when they break and they do the the clean chords that builds up to that one main riff. Yeah. That, yeah. I love that. I play that riff all the time. I love that. That was riff. excellent. Yeah. That's, that that also is not that hard to play. So you definitely could play that one too. Yeah. Um. Wait. Yeah, I love the intro to Oblivion. <laughs> that shit is awesome. Yeah. That's so good. See, that song is specifically what I'm talking about. Like a lot of people think that like they don't like the transition to the speed picking part. In that song, I think it like diverts it from the rest of the flow, like from the chorus and the intro and the bridge and all that. I don't think that at all. I don't <laughs> either. I like like and it is and it, it is an abrupt change, but I think it works. But I think that's like that's what a lot of criticisms that they that people have for them is that their transitions sometimes are just too random. I don't really think I just I don't really see like that they're random. 
Because yeah, like, I don't they, either. They clearly like lead into one another. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, and that one, it actually isn't too too hard either. Because like, yeah, it's fast, but like, it's not a lot of changing notes. There's only like two notes that change per like two measures or whatever. So it's it's just once you get down like picking a little bit faster with your wrist, like you can play that riff. Yeah. Okay. Nice. It's the same thing with Gojira. Like, their riffs are fast, and some of their stuff's hard to play, but a lot of it is, like, speed picking on one note or one string. I Unlike um, their other shit where it's, sorry. like, the, the bottom three strings they speed pick on, like, either, like, descending or ascending, <laughs> it's fucking difficult to do it cleanly. <laughs> right. Especially I've on never... Hand of Stone. You know, you know that, that speed picking part on Hand of Stone? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. That's, like, stretched out, like, three chords. Like, or not chords, but, like, it's, like, stretched out from like the one to the four to the three to the six from like the D to the E <laughs> it's fucking, it's wild. Oh. Yeah. This, uh, Mastodon is, um, they're, they're like the equivalent of like, like Peter Jackson when it comes to like directing. Cause like, you know, he, he did Lord of the Rings. Like he's so good at like making epic stuff, like, and, and having it come together and getting all these different, craftsman to like do the shit he wants to do yeah and 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 like and, and it is kind of showing off but also like it is justified you know yeah because like well i mean i don't think of like this like mastodon and them doing all this complicated stuff is like because like it doesn't well, have the, the michael bay effect no exactly that's a good way to put it that's that's what i was trying to say because like when Mastodon does this kind of stuff, like, I don't, I wasn't, I was never really thinking to myself, like, oh, that's, like, so hard. I mean, I, I was, but I wasn't, like, thinking, like, I was still I, listening to it as if it was music. Because a lot of people try to sell you the fact, like, oh, this, uh, this music that this person made, like, it's really, like, difficult, bro. Like, it's, it, you know, like, it, it, it's difficult. And it's like, well, if that's the only thing, then, like, I don't want to be sold on the fact that, it's hard like yeah. okay and like it doesn't need to be hard to be good like i just don't i think this i i harp on that a lot and obviously for other guitar players it might not be as difficult as it is for me i'm just thinking for me this shit's really hard to play and i think you get a better appreciation when you try to play like like pick a song from them and try to play it you know, like you'll get a, a better appreciation for it when you listen to because like like you said yeah like and i have the same opinion like just because it's a fast hard song to play doesn't make it good but a lot of their songs are super fast and hard to play and they're fucking awesome because like they flow and like they have good themes and good lyrics like it's not just douchebaggery and fucking showing off you know what i mean because like i don't get a i don't get a feeling of them showing off when i listen to their music it's just they just no, do it that just, innately right it just feels like it's just coming out like yeah it feels natural and that's what i like about them is like the shit's hard and it's fast but it, it doesn't feel yeah. like it's just you know it doesn't it doesn't seem disingenuous or forced yeah um I don't know how well you're versed in like film directors, Not um, really but a, well. a lot of people feel that about Alfonso Cuarón. He's the guy who directed Roma, that movie in 2018. That was black and white. It was like in set in Mexico. Yeah. He also did. He made Children of Men. He made the third Harry Potter movie. He made Itu Mama Tambien, and his thing is like. He's really into long takes and stuff like that. Oh, he also made Gravity. I'm sure you heard of that. Yeah, I've seen Gravity, I think. Yeah, and that's that's probably that's his worst movie. <laughs> it's the only one I've seen. Um right, and I, I and I'm sorry about that cuz he is such a phenomenal director. But like Gravity is everything like wrong about him. Cuz like like I said his 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 big thing is is long takes. But his all of his other movies, they they have really good stories, and he's really good at like showing stories and like plot elements and little details thing and all these things visually and like the way he constructs like his image. Like, cause he's he's a he's a really good cinematographer too. Like, I think some of his movies he actually he shot himself. Um, like Roma, I know. Um, but yeah, he's he's really into like into like that kind of stuff. But in Gravity you can really tell that he's just showing off and he's just trying to get his Oscar. And it's like, yeah, it is impressive. All of the stuff he, he did like that first, like that opening sequence of the movie. I don't know if you remember it's It's like 
12 minutes or some crazy length of time of just like one continuous take and like yeah it looks really nice the movie looks really nice but like i really wish that like all that stuff would have been like a smaller part of like a larger story and movie you know yeah but a lot of people i mean a, a, a lot of people have that opinion about alfonso Cuaron, like the showing off part about all of his movies but i think like i i i don't think that except for gravity even though like in his other movies like it it, it comes off more naturally but um, and I think Quentin Tarantino is kind of notorious for that too, just dragging out scenes. Um, I don't really think he got like that until later in his movies, when like well, definitely every- like in stuff like in Glory, like not really in Kill Bill, but like in Inglorious Bastards, that one and The Hateful Eight. I fucking hate The Hateful Eight so much. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, so boring. It- I'd like it a lot better if it wasn't as long. It's so long. <laughs> yeah, it did not need to be fucking three goddamn hours or however long it was. No, it's too long. It it didn't, but no, and it's 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 not his his best movie. But no. um, God, I hate wait, no. What 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 is your favorite Tarantino movie? Uh, probably Kill Bill. Honestly, I haven't seen that one yet. I, it's it's between that and Django. I fucking love Django. I have only seen bits and pieces of Django. Really? Yeah, I've never actually seen the whole thing. Bro, you gotta watch the whole movie. Um, I mean, I have the generic answer of Pulp Fiction, but I mean, it's like how you can't go wrong with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like it's so funny. It's so well made. It's 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 like I love how it's this meditation on art, and how like. And I, and I and I know tons of people get tons of different things from the movie, but like what I get out of it is like, well, I mean the title itself, like Pulp Fiction, meaning like you just enjoy it because it's entertainment and it's fun, and like yeah you get that, but it, it's it's like also simultaneously saying a lot of stuff about like, like do, like about like everything has to mean something, you know, like how how um like um marcellus wallace had like the had like the briefcase of whatever it was in there and like we never know what's in there and people are like oh like what's in it what's in it and then like quentin tarantino's like it's just it's whatever you want it to be you know like <laughs> um yeah and and it like obviously like samuel jackson is so funny yeah oh my god he is still so hilarious in that movie um yeah and yeah. i <laughs> Yeah, he. I mean, obviously, he's a controversial character for various reasons. Recently, he fucking <laughs> people putting together that he has like a foot fetish and shit. Wait, you're talking about controversial character Samuel Jackson or Tarantino? No, Quentin Tarantino. Oh well, yeah, that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, guys, he's probably just fucking with people. Like, he's really good at that. Well, it makes that one scene in Kill Bill a lot funnier about her trying to wiggle her toe. <laughs> I've never seen it, but... You've never seen oh. Kill Bill? Holy fuck, Will. I, j- I just told you that. Ah, oh, God. No, the, the foot you fetish thing... You just said you thing... haven't seen Django. Yeah, no, I've only seen, like, half of his movies. I've, I've only seen... I've seen Pulp Fiction. I've seen Inglorious Bastards. I've seen Reservoir Dogs. That's a really underrated one. I really like Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, Have that you seen that good. one? Yeah, I have. You know, I love that ending scene. That, like, was just really well done. Um, and then I have seen his, like, his newest one with Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio. That one was really I hated I that, that one. one. Really? I thought yeah, it was kind of Yeah, again, that one was too fucking long for no reason. Well, okay, all of his movies are fucking long for no reason. But... Yeah, but that one just took a toll on me. I don't know. Like, it didn't get, it didn't start getting good until, like, the last part of it. Oh, that last scene that I was like, yeah. Um, okay. Like I, I, I was totally like, forgot that that's what that was going to allude to. Cause I knew that beforehand watching the movie that it was going to allude to the Manson shit, but I never, fu- like I forgot about it halfway through. Like I was like, what the fuck is the point of this again? Right. Well, yeah. So I didn't know anything about the Mansons or anything about, or like Sharon Tate. I didn't know anything about that whole story. So like I was watching this movie. I had no idea who these people are. But when that came at the movie, you know, like I was, I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> so that was a complete shock to you. Yeah, no, I was kind of, like, I was like, whoa, like, <laughs> oh, huh. I mean, yeah, yeah that it was, was like, a, that was a big deal. Yeah, but I mean, that was like brutal, <laughs> like that, you know. 
I can't remember if um because I know Manson's dead, but I don't remember if the the girls are dead or if they are released from prison. I don't think so, but I don't know. I think they died. No, but the foot fetish thing in that movie was like ridiculous. <laughs> I was like, okay, like you don't need to shoot a shot of like her putting her feet up on like the the uh, on the hood of the car. I'm like, okay, you don't need to do. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Fucking Carantino. He's an art. He's an art tour. I'll give him that. Um, are you familiar with any other director's work? Not really. I mean, I I don't pay attention to it. I don't know why, but if I watch a movie and someone's like, "Oh, I really like that director," and I've seen the movie, like, "Oh, I can, yeah, I can get into it." But, like, I've never like watched a movie from a specific director just because of that reason, just to check them out. Like, I just, I don't know. I'm not really into movies like that. All right. Well, yeah, I I was into movies like that, and like in a similar way, you're into music and stuff like that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's like my two favorite directors are Alfonso Cuaron and Alejandro González Iñárritu. I think I told you about him too. He made The Revenant and... Um, I did like The Revenant. Yeah, he, he made The Revenant, Birdman, um, Beautiful. Have you ever heard of that movie? It's like it's spelled B-I-U, uh, Tiffel. Like, it doesn't sound familiar. It's with Javier Bardem, that guy from No Country for Old Men. With the weird uh, haircut. Yeah. It's a really sad, like, somber movie about this guy. It has a really cool concept. And, like, it, and it, that's actually... It, I'm correlating this with with Mastodon and how they, they have this, this aura of just, like... Man, like, they have all these cool things. Like, these little nuggets of, like, things here and there that I find all the time. And I'm like, whoa, this is, like, a really cool concept. Um... So with this movie, uh, Beautiful, starring Javier Bardem, it's about this guy, well, play, played by Bardem. He he lives in Barcelona, and he's on like like he's he's a good man, and like he's he's trying to like um, like just you know provide for his like family and stuff like that. But like obviously you know he's he's in on like with with all the, like this this crime and stuff like that in the streets of Barcelona, um, and like even though he doesn't really want to because he's just on the wrong side of you know, he's just on the wrong side of the law, but, um, he, he finds out that he has, uh, prostate cancer and he only has like a, a, a few months, I think left to live, you know? Yeah. And it's really sad. Cause like, he just, I mean, he, I don't know if he ever actually tells his, his, his family and, and all that stuff. So he's just like, man, like what the fuck do I do? But he discovers that he has this, strange connection to the supernatural world and he can commune with like spirits and like he can see people before like he can see people that are about to die like when they're di- it's, it's it's really interesting and it's hard to explain it does sound like seeing... an interesting concept right because like it, the movie never actually explicitly states what it is which i really like it's just kind of just this this thing he has, and it's not like a fantasy movie, at all. Like like, do do do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it, yeah, I get it. It has elements of it. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's like fantasy, or if it's like a mental illness thing. Like it's just it's this really cool thing, and he has this ability to com- communicate with the supernatural world, and it's all, and then like I and his performance, he's so good. Like you just really root for him. The whole movie. When did it come out? Yeah, uh, 2010. Okay. Right. And it's... Uh, I guess more like an independent film kind of vibe. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not... It wasn't like a studio movie, I don't think. But even though, like, Inyaritu has made studio films like Birdman and The Revenant, but... Um, oh! Inyaritu also made this really good movie. I think I told you about... Did I tell you about Amores Perros? I don't think so. Or sorry, Amores Perros. It is this. It's also one of my favorite movies because I must. I must specify these are all like my favorite movies, like, like beautiful, Am- Amores Perros, and like even the Revenant. That's up there with me. Some of my favorite movies, and like all the Alfonso Cuarón stuff I mentioned. Those are like yeah. so, like also like my favorite movies. So like Amores Perros is about this car crash that happens in Mexico City, and how it affects three people's lives, 
and it's to- and you, you see how it like like from their perspective how it affects them and it's all kind of told like out of um like it's not in chronological order you know similar to like a tarantino kind of thing yeah yeah and it's it's it there's like flashbacks and stuff like that it's it's really good the soundtrack is really good i love the performances um yeah and like it's it's about this one guy so like the three plots are like this one guy wants to go he wants to escape from like he he doesn't he doesn't want to live in mexico city anymore and like he just wants to like escape and like run off with his uh his sister-in-law actually (laughs) um they start (laughs) having actually yeah he's they start having an affair um (laughs) yeah and then um but he is on and, and the reason for the film's title which means love is a bitch is he's in on these mexico city underground dog fights it's really brutal but it's it's like so he's in on that um and yeah like like you, you if if you watched it you really think it's cool how like they weave in everyone's fate based on like what happens to a dog it's it's really cool and there's also like and a lot of people don't like to watch it because it has a bunch of shots of like bloody dead dogs and stuff like that and it can it can be sad to a lot of people i mean i mean to me it doesn't bother me because i never liked dogs um (laughs) yeah sorry yeah fuck him man no i'm sorry but um so it, it weaves that plot with this the second plot is like this model from spain who is like doing some stuff in mexico and she gets like depressed because the car crash like it ruins her legs so she has to just be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life and stuff like that but then it, it also shows like her relationship with her dog and stuff like that. It's really weird how like like dogs is like the theme of the movie and it's not like some cheesy like throwaway garbage movie you saw in like the summer. It's, it's Viewers really of Marley and me might like this. <laughs> right, exactly. Like it's probably the best dog movie of all time. And it's the, if if that's like a thing. And then the third plot is the most like it's really mysterious and also kind of sad. It's like about this this hitman who is trying to like get back in touch with his daughter that he hasn't spoken to in a while yeah it's 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 a, it's a really really good movie i have to check it out cuz a lot of these sound like really interesting premises to me yeah man i got to so speaking of that for the next recommendation i wanted to instead of listening to an album i wanted you to watch city of god with me City of God. Yeah, or Cidade de Deus in Portuguese. Is a movie in Portuguese? Yes, but with subtitles. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um we just gotta figure out when to watch it. Cause like I know our schedules are weird. Are you talking about like watching it together and like talking about it on the podcast or just watching it and then talking about it afterwards? Well, I I'd rather just like watch it with you and like I'll <laughs> And just, like, laugh at stuff that we'd probably both think is funny. Because, like, none of my family members are ever going to watch it with me. So, like, I kind of wanted to get the experience of watching it with somebody. <laughs> no, I feel you. Or, or if you have, like, any questions or something, like, maybe I could answer it. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd be down. I think it'd be a good change of pace to do some movie reviews instead of just music. Yeah. But, um, yep, yeah, that's basically my taste in movies. Like, Spanish and Portuguese and like slash um like worldly mixed with spiritual things like yeah <laughs> oh Something and also more eclectic a- than like all the average marvel fan yeah fuck that shit i'm sorry to be in the cinema <laughs> right i apologize for saying that but um <laughs> so i like a lot of that and then it's mixed in with um like i love revenge stuff and i love like one last time kind of stories yeah, the one last ride. Yeah, like I really love, um, like I the Revenant for that reason, but I also really love, um, I love the last Harry Potter movie. I think that movie's really well done. The what was it? Deathly Hallows? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, the Deathly Hallows. I mean, the first part's really boring, but the second <laughs> part when it's just it's all just like action and stuff. That I thought that was really cool. The Harry Potter franchise is in trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, whatever that 
was. That was really stupid. I was so confused. What do you mean? Like, with the whole J.K. Rowling getting canceled, I was like, what? Yeah. I thought she was liberal. <laughs> it well, made I no mean, sense. That doesn't save people anymore. They just have to follow a specific ideology. Otherwise, you're Well, right, you're but I thought grabs. she... Right, but I thought she did follow that ideology, so that's why I was so confused. No, I think... when I haven't really followed it, but I don't know... If, again, this is all second accounts, but, like, I mean, just being... I guess, like, they call them TERFs, so just, like, radical feminists that think that, you know, trans people are taking away womanhood <laughs> or something like that. I don't quite oh, yeah, know exactly cause... what they believe, but, like, they just... They don't mm-hmm. like trans... I don't know if they don't like them or just don't believe in it or whatever the fuck, but it's something to do with that transphobia nice oh well <laughs> i actually just thought this going back to like the, the the movies thing i'm really into like concept movies if you know what i'm saying where i'm like yeah. man i love that concept like you like you sold me on the concept not like oh i want to watch marvel <laughs> <You know? laughs> which is what it should be honestly well Good right because i think right because i think this is, like, how I see it. Like, this is not anything I've ever seen anywhere. Like, I'm kind of just coming up with this right now. Like, I think that there's there's concept movies and then there's franchise movies. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And, like, I mean, a lot of franchise movies start off from, like, a concept movie. Like, Star Wars, like, the original one is a concept movie. Even though, like, it's very based. Like, it, it it's, it's definitely derivative of, like, basic... Um, like mythology and worldly things, but it blends it all together in this concoction where it's like, oh, this is a movie where it's like a, a really kind of bizarre mix of Eastern and Western culture in space, you know? Like, And it's like, oh, wow, that's kind of a cool idea. That's a cool yeah. concept. Or um, how like Spider-Man, you know, is like just the concept. I mean, I know like this Spider-Man it, he existed before they made the movie in 2002. But even if you don't know about the comic, the idea that it's just like, oh, this is a man who is bitten by a radioactive spider, accidentally is responsible for the death of his uncle, and is in guilt for like the whole story, and that's like the hook of it. And he has supernatural spider powers from the bite. Like, that's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think sometimes that's the more disappointing thing where I like I love the idea conceptually and I think it's a great thing, but it's just not executed well. And I think The Purge is a great example of that. I love the concept of The Purge, but I just think the movies are really shitty. It's so It just sucks so bad. Um, same deal with Django. I've only seen bits and pieces of them. I've never actually seen them. You didn't, you didn't like it from the bits that you saw? No, it seemed kind of stupid. It, like, like, it didn't... It didn't seem well, like, made. It didn't, like... It, it just felt so juvenile. No, you gotta, you gotta watch the whole movie because you miss a lot of context from the beginning. Okay. I mean, like, most of his movies. But, like, I mean, some of it, yeah, is kind of silly, but a lot... Like, it does have a lot of serious undertones and, like, an actual story. Okay, I see. Yeah, I actually... I kind of want to make, like, a video about this explaining, like, concept versus franchise and how, like... yeah. Franchise is stuff that like you're like there's there's more iconography from it, you know, and stuff like that and and like. Do you see where I'm getting at, kind of? Yeah, I do. Because even like really good franchise movies like Predator or Alien, or things like that, they still have like those those really like. And this is not a bad thing, obviously, but it just it 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 has a lot of iconography that's established that is kind of like it's 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 relied on in like later movies in the series and stuff like that yeah um whereas opposed to like can you think of like iconography from the revenant no (laughs) you're just like that was a damn good movie yeah i think you have to have and see like enjoying it from different aspects but did you see the new predator that came out on hulu i think it's called um no i've only seen the first predator movie I actually really liked it. I don't know if I was telling you about it. It takes place, I think, back in like the 1600s, and the Predator oh, goes back in to the Comanches yeah. and shit. It was really good. Yeah, it's like the Predator in in Mexico or something. No, he's not in Mexico. He's in somewhere in the states or by or in Canada. I think it was in Canada. 
because oh, but, they had but, French trappers that were in the movie. Right, but it's like Native American and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, Comanche. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah that that did seem like a cool idea that could be like done well. I liked it um, a lot because it was basically the the premise was um one of the girls she wanted to be I don't know what her actual role is but she wanted to be a hunter and she kept practicing with her tools and her arrows and her axes and trying to do that and her brother wouldn't let her because he just mm -hmm. couldn't think that she'd handle it and so the whole movie is that she keeps getting into scenarios where she runs into the predator but survives and every time she gets an encounter with him she's like studying his technology and how to fucking like kill him because she really it's like they're right i don't remember what they call it in the movie but it's like it's their right of passage to kill like a tough animal like a bear right and that's how they become i in lack for lack of a better term like becoming respected in the tribe right Okay. So she picked that as her thing, and so she, the whole movie is her trying to figure out how to kill Predator. It was really good. That actually, yeah, like the way you're talking about it, it does sound like a a cool like idea, and I think yeah. it has sold me. Like that does sound really cool. It was great, and like I said, a lot of the Predator movies are kind of stupid, and that's why I, I don't like a lot of them, especially like the Alien vs. Predator and all that shit. But I've this only one, seen it, the first one. But the first one was okay. I mean, it's cheesy. Oh, no, dude, art. the the first one, like I'm telling you, give it a rewatch. It's good because I love how like the first half of the movie is like really cheesy 80s. Like just the like it's like the manliest movie ever <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. But then I love how the, the more the movie goes on, it gets more like almost like a horror movie. And then by the end, it's just like all of like this like yelling like primal awesomeness <laughs> i think it's 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 a really good one yeah i mean i i do enjoy it but like it just the the, the concept got tiring for me but That's i was funny. but i like this one a lot because like the the way they designed everything was really cool people were bitching about how predator looked but he i didn't think he looked cool he looked more animalistic in this one it was really it was kind of cool looking as opposed to his normal up. like futuristic predator 2022 i think it's just called prey it's on hulu yeah it's called prey oh well yeah he does look more like an animal yeah it's i liked it he had like a skull helmet on like it was cool um people didn't like I, how his his hair and like the color of like him he looks like native american it's cool yeah he's like a wendigo or something yeah oh yeah i didn't think about that but uh but yeah, yeah i i liked it a lot and I've been seeing a lot of, I, there's been a lot of, like, Native American stuff, like, uh, Reservation Dogs is kind of like a comedy about these Native kids on a reservation that are stealing money and doing, like, hood rat shit to try to escape to California, um, and there's a couple of, there's something else I've seen, too, it's, there's been a lot of Native stuff recently that I've enjoyed watching. Oh, this isn't exactly Native American, I mean, it kind of is, but, um... There was this movie I watched in Spanish not too long ago. It's called Sin out. Nombre. Have you ever heard of it? Hello? Where'd you go? Cotton Eye Joe. Hello? You cut out, bro. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> what happened? I was closing out all the apps and I didn't realize... <laughs> <laughs> I closed out of the Discord app. <laughs> nice. Right. Well, so anyways, um, I asked, have you ever heard of Sin Nombre is the name of the movie? No. Okay. So it, um, it starts out in Honduras, and it's about this Honduran girl who goes with her dad, and, like, they they hitchhike all across, like, Latin America and into Mexico and, like, try to get to, like, the you know, get to the U.S. and stuff like that. And, um, this one guy who, he's in the cartel, and he doesn't want to be in there anymore. So, like, he and, um, and, like, two other guys from the cartel, they, they go and, like, they hijack the train, too. And, like, they, they terrorize, um... Like they, they, they terrorize the people on the train and stuff like that. But then one of them kills the the leader who actually was the guy who went with him. He kills the leader of the cartel there to, to save these people that he was going to kill. 
but then all the the cartel finds out and so then they chase after them hmm. so like so like the whole movie is like like a like a chase scene essentially you have to watch it that sounds interesting yeah but, and like what were you saying about um that one not being native american what are you talking about well no because like i mean like a, a lot of hispanics are like ethnically native americans so that's just what made me think about it no i'm saying like it was a legitimate like comanche tribe oh, oh yeah i'm so sorry i didn't i i, I didn't understand yeah yeah I, I, mean, I, I see what you're saying that's guess, like actually that's like directly native american i believe so i mean they're in like the southern plains no oh, right but that's just the that made me think of like sin nombre mm. and like that kind of like cultural and and and, and that like aesthetic you know i see yeah yeah but it's it's really cool because you get to see like the 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 um the cartel culture and like the gang stuff it's brutal dude just watching narcos <laughs> or not even yeah not even that true. like like watching like the fucking cartel beheading people with chainsaws when I was younger, like that's what solidified. Like, oh fuck. Yeah, well, I've people are a never, problem. I've never seen that, and I don't want to. So yeah, it's fucking brutal. Yeah, my friend has described to me, um, in detail this like the 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 torture stuff he's seen. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like that's that's brutal, man. Yeah, you were telling me about how like there was that town where like they put some skulls, or no, or like some people's heads in front of it, saying to keep. Yeah, out. they like massacred a whole fucking town, set up as their base of whatever fucculations, and then they like yeah, why at man? the entrance like, they like fucking piked people, like man, like <laughs> stupid, I'm like not a good look, bro. It's really weird. I mean, it just goes to show, like, not even culture aside. Right, like, if you just, you'll do anything for power, so, like, you'll fucking murder your own people who have nothing to do with your shit. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it doesn't matter. Right, I mean, it's like Pablo Escobar with, like, putting the bomb on the plane. Like, really, man? Like, I'll die <laughs> before I leave Colombia. I love my country and my people. It's like, not really, bro. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I believe that he was, like, he was sincere, but he wasn't really actually doing that <laughs> without him realizing it or not. But, yeah. Yeah. I love, yeah, like how in the early part of the show, he's like a, he's like a Robin Hood kind of person, you know? Yeah, you, you, especially if you don't know, like, the outcome or the story, like, you really empathize with him. Yeah, I mean, the only shitty thing about him, and that what made me not like him, is that how he wasn't, like, loyal to his wife, and he, like, had an affair with, like, the, um, the, the news lady. Well, that's part of the culture. I mean, yeah, that, that's bound no, to happen. No, right. But, like, other than that, like, you really do kind of like him. Because, like, he really... Like, as you can see, like, where he comes from and, like, what he actually is trying to do. And yeah. he's a really layered character. And I love... Obviously, like, Wagner Mora's performance is just, like, he's incredible. Like, he just has this weight to him. And I love his broad spectrum of emotions that he has. When yeah. playing Pablo Escobar, like I love how he gets like so pissed off and angry, but then he also is like really like he play, plays him like that. But then he also like you know when he's with his family and his wife, like he's this really good father and like this really loving and caring person. Like it's a really he's such an interesting character, and I love how they because like I don't really know much about how he was in real life, but I mean like how they wrote him in the show. Like I don't really care if it's historically accurate or not. Like he's a really well written character, and I enjoyed watching him. Well, you have to think that, like, people aren't the same way all the time. So, like, you have to feel like people, like, like <laughs> characters in movies aren't the only things in existence that have, you know, arc and dynamic. Like, people in real life do as well. And people are more complicated than well, they're huh. displayed or portrayed. You know what I mean? Like, they all just right. are. No, right. Because, I mean, then then we wouldn't even be able to relate to, to characters in movies. But Exactly. Well, I, I mean, I was just saying, like, I just don't really know how he was in real life. Um, so he probably yeah. was worse, honestly, like, and like in the, in the series, the only real thing that obviously the worst thing he did was put a bomb on the plane, he became from like a drug trafficker to a fucking narco terrorist. Like <laughs> yeah, he did that, um, to his own people too, just because yeah, I, don't, also... I don't even remember why I think somebody was, had some information or that he wanted to, I can't remember why he did it. Oh, the, the bomb on the plane. 
Yeah, I don't remember the reason. Oh, it's it's because he knew the president was going to be on that plane. Oh, and then like he changed it or something. Yeah, so he was he knew he he knew that well he understood that the president was going to be on that plane. And then he tried to assassinate the president, but then um remember Steve from the informant right before he was killed by poison he he told him and like he was speaking to him in spanish or steve didn't understand but he said that like you know like hey like 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 paul paul is gonna kill him like he's gonna be there in cali you you, you gotta like like uh, g- uh not let him go and then before he even like um understood fully what he was saying he had tried to get a translator but then when that happened venom or sorry poison sorry venom that was his name in spanish like when poison came in and just killed suarez the informant like you know, he didn't have any more information, but he knew, like, okay, something's going to go down in the plane to Cali. I got to be careful. And then that he was like, hey, like, Mr. President, like, I don't think you should go on this plane. <laughs> like, he just oh, went off. that's of, right. He just went off his instinct. He's like, I just, I don't want you to go. The thing that was fucked, too, like, the the kid that he recruited to do that got all excited. He he thought he was, like, taking pictures or I can't remember what I he know. thought he was doing. But I like, was he had like, the bomb that's on him. so <laughs> That's so sad. And like you saw him before, like he just got married and like he had a he had a kid. Like yeah, I think stuff like that might be obviously embezzled and uh, embellished, but <laughs> no, you I know. think right, right. But I think the the sadder thing was like he he killed like everyone who could have connected him to that. So like he had to like he he made like poison and the other guy like go out and like kill his wife and, and baby i was like man okay yeah. man like oh that's, that's right. i forgot about that too right like i was literally gonna cry when when she was just like on her knees like like please don't kill me please don't kill me like think about and like i was like oh man that's 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 really sad <laughs> and like just with no remorse like poison just just blew her in the head like yeah, and I think they represented him good because I was watching like the differences between the real life um, people and the characters on the show, and I think that guy they fucking nailed. He was just a stone cold psycho. Oh yeah, poison. I think he's a fucking was a serial really killer, good... pretty much. Like like straight I... up. Yeah, I really liked him. I mean, I thought he was cute. okay. Don't get me wrong. Like he was a, he was a piece of shit, but like I really liked his personality. Yeah, and I know uh, like yeah, like you said, he was just a stone cold killer. And fucking Sicario. Yeah, he was a Sicario, my. Like space, yeah, my. <laughs> the one, th- the one thing you need to finish, and the the re- like this one was I. I'm very curious to know who how, how he was in real life was uh Felix Gallardo. Um, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because in the show they portray him as like a guy that just like is tired of being like a shitty cop and tired of being poor, so it's like. He just gets himself into situations and he eventually just wants power and so like he very sl- like throughout the whole series like he really wasn't that bad of a character he never killed anybody he never i don't from and i may be wrong but i don't think he really ordered anybody to get killed he's always just trying to fix the mistakes of his own people and his gang <laughs> oh okay like i just he he was more of like a businessman but it was got towards the end where he was starting to get greedy and starting to get people killed because he didn't want to get caught and all that kind of shit until it eventually like fucked him over with all his other um because like, you know you know the story of him trying to make like a one united national mexican cartel like an organization yeah that's what like i'm in i'm like on like the fourth or fifth episode of the first season i'm not that far yeah but so, yeah that that happened like he tried to get it going he's definitely a guy you could empathize with because like he was quiet he only got mad at like the worst shit but like he never like it's just very strange, and I'm, that's why I'm very curious to know what he was like in real life. I, I actually, I think he's still alive. I want to say he is too. Yeah. Yeah, I believe he's he's alive in prison, and like in real life, he denies it. Like he like he still just denies his involvement with the cartel and everything. It's really funny. Is he in Mexican or American prison? I think he's in Mexican prison. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> I believe so. Okay. Um. Well. I am liking the Mexican show, but like the Colombian one, I think is no. Is the, just... the Colombian one's ten times better for sure. Colombian but... one is a okay. It's a but yeah, but like I was telling you before, awesome. like what happens to to Kiki Camarena is fucking. Yeah. <laughs> you told me. I'm curious to know what this is. It's not like it's. I'm, it's hard to explain. Like it's. It was a big like even in real life, it was a big deal. Like that's the one thing that Felix Gallardo denies was what happened to him. Um, 
but yeah, in the it's just like I said, there's a lot of character like I think the characters are even more dynamic in the Mexican one because like they're it's a lot more human esque. Like there wasn't that really there's only a couple like characters that were stone cold and that was um Pacho Herrera. That he was one of those characters. Oh again you said? He's the gay dude. Oh, in the Colombian one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he comes Pacho back in the Herrera, Mexican yeah. series. Oh wait, does he actually? Yeah. Oh, they just fucking... Nah, I don't care. It's, it's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would have been excited to see that, but... I mean, okay, I, it doesn't matter. I, I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it when he comes anyways. How many episodes is he in? I don't remember. It's a couple. Yeah, because I know he was, um... He was buddies with, um, Amado Carrillo Fuentes. The... Yeah, and that's the story it kind of follows, because, um, like, after yeah. Felix's downfall, Amado was the one that kind of picked up the pieces before he oh okay okay and he dies a really stupid death in real life it's really fucking funny how he dies oh a model yeah i don't remember if it's in the show or not i i think they they mentioned something about it and i was like what that's not true and i looked it up and it was fucking true okay i like a i think he's he's cool yeah he's a cool character i i've always liked his character no but do you know who my favorite character in in mexico is so far what don neto (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> that dude i i'm like i want to sit down and have a modelo with you and just like just be <laughs> chilling like i want to i want to have a cerveza with you mike <laughs> yeah he um <laughs> no, no 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 you know what i'm talking about with like the say space in my yeah like the, yeah, that's, that's him that is that's so definitely him. his character <laughs> say space in my <laughs> he kind of is a pain in the ass like like he gets more annoying as the series goes on Oh really? Because yeah, okay, he, he kind of loses his cool factor. Okay, yeah, because as far as I'm, like when I'm in right now, like he's just he's 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 saucing. Yeah, he's cool for the first couple. Okay, yeah. Um. Also, I I I don't know what I feel about Rafa. I don't know if you remember him. I I hated his character. I hate characters like him. Because like I know like there's a bunch yeah, of people in real really life know. that I know that are like him. That's why he irritates the shit out of me. Well, yeah, I know because he's such Just a... that wannabe fucking cholo game. Oh, I hate that so. Yeah, much. he's like a wannabe. Like he's a fuck boy. Like he's, he's just, retarded he's a... too. He's... he's retarded. He's a pretty boy. You know stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I hate his character so much, and he fucks up. Like it gets to the point where I'm not gonna spoil anything, but like him and Felix obviously fucking get into it throughout the whole series because <laughs> he's just a fucking screw up. Right. Um, well, even if like like I'm I'm still conflicted about him. I do like his like stuff, his relationship with Felix so far. Yeah. Because you could tell like they like go a, a long way back, you know. Yeah. And you know, if it's true, stuff. I don't. I haven't really looked into too much. If it's true, like he was the person that really like developed the specific strain of weed that got popular for them. Like that's the biggest deal, honestly. Uh, uh Rafa. Yeah. Yeah, I know, and like you said, he's literally retarded in the show. Yeah. <laughs> like he's so stupid he's just like orale <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I fucking I can't stand his character so much he's spacing me um, no but I, I second my opinion that the best character in all of the narcos is Jorge Salcedo yeah he I, was one of my favorites too. I love that guy that guy is like like that's like what I want to be you know not the narcos part but like well the, he only he he didn't like like he was trying to get out but no the, right right the cool but, thing about or this the really sad thing about him and i don't i think this part was true too was that when he went to witness protection in the states that last shot of him like looking depressed in a kfc like waiting for his dinner like that fucking hit me for some reason like his life got ruined yeah to fucking but like bring these guys in so he's just some random dude in the states being a nobody like it's it sucks yeah but like does he even like see his family like what happened I don't remember. I just, like I said, I remember that he had to become anonymous in the States and witness protection. So he obviously went under a new name and identity and all that shit. But I don't, I don't remember if his family was with him or not. I don't think they were because I think it was sad. That's why I was like, damn, dude, his life is fucked. Yeah, because like his whole thing is like he wanted to escape and like have a new thing with his family. Yeah. Because like he really, like all of his, all of what he did and like all of what he did with the narcos, he did like out of love for his, his family, you know? Yeah. And that's what I like. I really like 
I, I, I felt for him. And I also, I just, I, I liked how he was just like the, the cool tech guy and he could like splice all these different things. Like he was a, he was a, like he was a valuable person, you know, yeah. like he was, he wasn't just like, Oh my God. Like, you remember, you remember, um, what's his name? Like, so there's Gilberto Rodriguez and then there's the, his brother, like Gilberto was the guy who got caught. And then his brother was, um, Oh, Miguel. Yeah. That was his name. Yeah. Miguel's son was like the biggest dipshit. I hated yeah. him. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, David. That dude was such a. Oh my god! Like, I was an ass dick. I hated him. <laughs> yeah, I I hate I, and like it, it's also good kudos to the acting and the story because like they do the part well. But just like, oh, I hate that kind of character, especially the ones that really fucks with the story and just makes the whole problem. Right. It's like you said with Rafa, which like I don't share that same sentiment about, about Rafa yet even though I might, but, like, with, with David, like, oh, my God, and he, and he always, like, hated Jorge, and then he sent the guy to, like, go kill his family. I was like, dude, that's, yeah. like, fu- that's fucked. And, well, I mean, I know he, I, I know at that point he knew that he he was the informant, but, um, yeah. Um, so, Jorge is the best character. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, oh, another thing, the third season, that last episode, I don't remember the last time I was more on edge. I don't like remember when they, what it was. It was like when they when they raided, you know, the 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 cartel headquarters. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and like at that point, like Miguel didn't know that Jorge was against him. So like he like so they had this whole plan to like capture Miguel. And all that stuff, but like Jorge still, you know, like 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 Miguel still trusted him, and and all that stuff. But then he had to like betray him, and like he didn't know what was gonna happen. And then like some shit got got um went bad, and like the, it didn't go according to plan. And like yeah, but yeah, I'll say one thing: there's no fucking way I'm ever being an informant for any government agency of the states. <laughs> Fuck that. Say space in my yeah for your life. Yeah. No. Exactly. Yeah, it, it kind of, when I was first watching Narcos, it kind of made me want to, like, work for the DEA, but I'm like, nah, 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 nah. No, you don't want to work for DEA, dude. That's a rough job. <laughs> no, it, it, exactly. Because I thought... And actually, it's like, a pointless job, too. Well, it, it, exactly. We could talk about that for, like, another three hours, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I do not want to work any longer for La Dea. La Dea. Yeah, yeah. so Narcos is a really good show. It's probably, like, one of my favorite shows, honestly. I wonder what's the next... Because, like, I'm sure... I'm Because I thought it was going to be more about... Or aren't they making it more about um, El Chapo? Oh, they're making the another one? one? I think so, because El Chapo didn't really get too much of... I thought that was going to be mainly what it was about before I watched it, but he really, like, he was... This was, like, in his early days where, like, he was kind of, like, a like a peon, and, like, he was just trying to... It was a, It was kind of coming to where he was going to be the boss. But it never Chapo, really followed his story. Is he in the the Narcos Mexico? He is, but he comes in later, and he's not that yeah. ma- he's not that really important of a character. He's kind of like the he's kind of like the henchman kind of thing. But then as the series progresses, he you can kind of see how he develops into wanting to be his own boss and all that shit. But I it didn't really follow his story at all. But I think the new Marcos that they're making as a continuation, I think, is specifically about El Chapo, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. I just said, like, I just thought to myself, I was like, I would love to see Narcos Brazil, but I'm like, oh, wait, you can just watch uh, City of God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm curious to see what the next one is going to be. Yeah. I mean, just because, uh, I mean, I haven't finished, obviously, the Mexico show, but I mean, the Colombian show, I was, I was impressed. <laughs> it, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll watch more. Um. But also, like, just the fact that I do speak Spanish just adds, like, another layer of, like, coolness to the show. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, like, all the different, like, idioms I hear and stuff like that. And a lot of it, I, I, I caught, like, even, like, me, well, I don't speak Spanish, but, like, I noticed that there was a bunch of mistranslations in the Netflix one, which is very strange. Yeah, I think I remember you talking about that. Like, what things specifically do you remember? Like, they would say words that they clearly were the wrong words. <laughs> because <laughs> like they're like the simple words that i know in spanish and like they were just not translated right 
Um, and then I, one of my friends was talking about, um, again, like there's like a bunch of different sayings that like did not really translate that well into English or is it like it took on a completely different meaning or is just, just not the right word. Like, do you remember anything specifically? I don't. Off the top of my head, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Well, a lot of them are. You can translate them into English, but then some things, it's like, yeah, it was better for me to just have the Spanish subtitles on because it's just yeah. easier to understand it within its like own terms. It's crazy. I think it's like one of the like if you think about it like it's a super popular show, but the majority of it's in Spanish. I know. That must have been like some kind of breakthrough thing cuz like Yeah. I, I can I can't think of anything else that like was that popular and it's in another language other than the maybe like, you know, Squid Game, but that came out I don't even like, you know, X years after. Not yeah, those... I think yeah, Squid Game definitely I think was the number one thing that people watched in subtitles. I mean, obviously some people watched the dub version, which I thought was awful. I usually watch dub shit, especially when it comes to, like anime. Like I don't even care, but like this one, I feel like yeah, you have to watch like, the subtitles. Anime is different, but like when it's yeah. in live action, like I'm I'm gonna watch whatever language it was made in. Especially because the fucking the the voices never match the people, and it just ends up being just super fucking goofy. It's so distracting. Yeah. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, because, like, other than, like, Narcos, that was, like, 2015 or something like that, right? I don't remember. But, yeah, whenever that was in Squid Game, I can't think of anything else that was, like, so popular in another language. Other than, like, all these other animes, but that's been out for so long. Yeah. And that's a whole, like, genre. It's not, like, a specific thing, you know? Like it's not like a specific show that everyone, you know. Um, no, I feel you. Yeah. Well, I think we're gonna leave it here. I think this was a nice, um, short podcast. Yeah, short and sweet. Yeah, it was good. Um, so we just need to figure out when we're gonna watch Citajes de Deus for. Yeah, I'll link up with you and then find a good day to do it. All right, sounds good, man. All right, buddy. All right. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Yes.